good afternoon everybody. I hope that you have enjoyed the first half of today and your rest period and your lunch. And now it gets even better because now we have the word of the Buddha himself. And uh, I asked Ajahn Brown to have a rest while I do this because if the great master's sitting here, then I feel a little bit like he should do the sutta class. But anyway, we have the Buddha and uh, Ajahn Brahm's having a little time to meditate for himself. He's still quite jet-lagged after arriving in the country a couple of days ago. Um, nevertheless, he's very happy to be here and he'll come and lead the guided meditation after this. So we thought that since this retreat is about peace and resting in peace, even now while you're still alive, instead of waiting until you're already dead, um, that one of the best ways to rest in peace is to rest with the breath, to rest in the present moment. And the breathing is a beautiful place to rest because it's always there. It's part of our body. It's part of our being, if you like. And it's obviously very much connected to life itself. And yet it's something that we very rarely take the time to notice. And... Uh, you know, the Buddha even said that breath meditation is a way of reflecting on death. The monks came to him and said, oh, I develop death contemplation. And he said, well, how do you do that? And they said, well, I think this could be my last day on earth. This could be my last day of life. And the Buddha said, no, that's very heedless. <laughs> that's not real death contemplation. And another monk said, well, I imagine that this is the last meal of my life. He said, terrible, you know, that's also very heedless. He said, the real death contemplation is recognizing that this could be our last breath, this very breath that we're experiencing now. This could be our last breath. When you're eating your food, it could be the last bite. You know, are you really present for that? Are you really putting gratitude and, and care into that, you know, reflecting that this food that you're receiving right now and that you're fortunate to eat is uh, coming through the hard work and sacrifice of so many beings, you know, and we're so blessed at this time to have beautiful food when many in the world are, you know, struggling to survive. Maybe they're undergoing famines, maybe they're even in war-torn um, countries at this time, you know, and here we are able to just eat this one morsel and breathe this one breath in safety and in peace. So we thought we'd get into a little bit on the Anapanasati Sutta, which is a, a very central teaching in the Buddhist texts. Very often uh, in this country, and maybe most Western countries, um, coming from Burma, the practice of the Satipatthanas is very pos uh, popular, and also uh, so-called Vipassana, insight practice. And yet, very few people understand that breath meditation also leads to insight. Breath meditation also completes the four satipatthanas. Just by watching the breath, you can experience uh, the body, you can experience feeling, the second satipatthana, you can experience the mind itself, and also the contents of the mind. And so this is a very simple practice, and one that the Buddha used himself to attain nibbana. So obviously, this isn't the whole path, and I'll explain the context of breath meditation um, in the Buddhist suttas, but I did want to look at the Anapanasati Sutta today with everybody here. I think you've all received the word of the Buddha on the little emails, but I'm kind of chuffed that you don't have it here in a way, because sometimes it's nicer just to imbibe the teachings and to you know, use your head too much. But for future reference, it is on page 46. And we're starting with a passage from the Majjhima Nikaya number 118, which is the Anapana Sati Sutta. So I'll start reading and I'll explain a little bit as we go and try to make it practical so that it supports your meditation. And as with any of these teachings that we offer, you know, you don't need to absorb everything. It's amazing that our kind of intuitive wisdom knows what we need and it will just pick up the bits that resonate for us. So none of this is a doing, it's more of a passive receiving and just allowing these things to sink in and to see how they condition your mind. So in this little passage, the Buddha says, 
When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and great benefit. And the Buddha's not mincing his words here when he says great fruit and great benefit. It's like a capital G in neon lights. It means enormous, unfathomable benefit, far more benefit than, you know, even coming on a three-day retreat. If you really cultivate mindfulness of breathing in your daily life and as a practice, as a central part of the practice, it can lead the whole way. So he explains further. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it completes the four focuses of mindfulness. That's the four satipatthanas that I explained. So they're basically areas that we're supposed to direct our mindfulness. And the Buddha always asked us to direct our mindfulness to experiences that are possible to have in the here and now and experiences that are part of our body and mind. So basically, again, the body, the feelings in the body, the mind and the contents of the mind. And here Ajahn Brahm, this is Ajahn Brahm's translation, and he uses the four focuses of mindfulness rather than the four foundations of mindfulness. So for any of you that are Buddhist and have read these things and are familiar with the usual translation, there's a difference there. And the main difference, which may seem small, but it actually has quite an implication for practice, is that uh, we don't establish mindfulness uh, on these things as the foundation. We already have a degree of mindfulness through the other practices of virtue and contentment and being uh, happy with little and living a simple life. So we already have a degree of mindfulness that we then focus on those areas of existence, yeah? So he's talking about the four focuses of mindfulness here. When the four focuses of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they complete the seven enlightenment factors, which hopefully we'll go into later. When the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they complete true knowledge and deliverance, enlightenment. So this is how Nibbana is possible through the practice of simply receiving the breath, simply staying with the breath long enough for it to reveal the secrets of reality to us. And another interesting part that Ajahn Brahm insisted I, I share, <laughs> and there's a little caveat if anybody has sensitivity to um, dying in any way, um, but this is a warning not to practice this way, is that the Buddha actually taught Anapana Sati after a group of monks were doing a lot of contemplation on the disgusting nature of the body. And the Buddha actually taught us to sometimes understand the um, limitations of the body. You know, the fact that it's, there's nothing really beautiful here, right? It's skin, it's teeth, it's hair, it's flesh. And they're the things we actually see. We see the bones, right? we see our skull really. You can like put your fingers in your mouth and <laughs> pull your lips away and it's like, ooh, you look like a skeleton. And it's just there, it's just under the surface. So the Buddha wanted us to contemplate this, not to get a version and not to kind of say, ooh, you know, the opposite gender is disgusting, I should be celibate. Ah! but just to come to some kind of balance in the mind, you know, between passion and disgust. So that we just see body as body. There's nothing much to get excited about. But unfortunately these monks, and it was monks, I don't know if nuns ever did this, but the monks went a little bit too far and they were so disgusted with their body through this contemplation and with the body of others that they ended up committing suicide in the Buddha's absence. And the Buddha came back after some time away and he said to his chief disciple or his attendant, Venerable Ananda, he said, why is the Sangha so diminished? You know, there was hardly anybody there, you know, hundreds of these monks ended up uh, taking their lives and even taking the lives of other monks. And, uh, and of course he explained, well, they went too far with this practice and, uh, and this is what it led to. And as a result of that, the Buddha said, I'm going to teach the remaining Sangha the practice of breath meditation. Yeah. 
So this is quite interesting because it shows that breath meditation is not meant to be tiresome and difficult and lead to stress and distress, but it's actually supposed to be something beautiful, something enjoyable. And the Buddha said that breath meditation leads to samadhi. It leads to what he called the pleasant abidings here and now. They're the states of deep samadhi, jhanas. Yeah. So breath meditation was actually an antidote to uh, practices that make the mind tight and tense and distressed. I don't know about you, but when I started breath meditation in uh, one of the Vipassana traditions, which I'm incredibly grateful to for setting me off on the path, it was quite a struggle for me to stay with the breath. It really was the case that, you know, after one breath, my mind would disappear and you know, and I'd have to drag it back in again. And it'd disappear again after a couple of breaths and oops, it's gone, drag it back in. You know, and sometimes the gap between those two breaths and the bringing it back was about half an hour of fantasy and <laughs> all kinds of prolific thoughts. So the meditation was really drag meditation, drag it back, drag it back. And you know, this is not very exciting, not very fun. So something was wrong there in the approach. And uh, one of the beautiful things I found in Ajahn Brahm's way of teaching was this emphasis on joy. And he often says, you know, it's the joy with the breath that like sticks the mind to it. It's almost like the glue that enables you to stay present to the breath. And, uh, and this is directly found in this sutta. After the first uh, few stages, the Buddha quickly brings in experiencing joy with the breath. And then the path becomes quite automatic, quite natural. And in this way, it leads to these seven enlightenment factors. From mindfulness of the breath, we get joy, we get what's called piti, we get tranquility and samadhi. And resulting from that, a lot of equanimity. So these are the pleasant abidings. And the other beautiful thing he said about uh, breath meditation is that it overcomes thinking. He actually uses the word upachedaya, vitaka upachedaya. It means cutting through thinking, basically. So the breath is almost like it's a substitute for our thoughts. You know, when we're with the breath for that moment, we come back to the present. We come back to something very tangible in the here and now. And if you're really with the breath, as I said, you know, it's very present. And it can bring this kind of recollection that this is all we have, right? This breath could be the last. So it's a kind of substitution. The Buddha talks about different ways of overcoming thought, but one of them is substituting thinking for something else. So this breath kind of substitutes the the thinking at that time and cuts through um, all that fantasy, bringing us back to something real. So, and of course, as I mentioned, it can lead to the deep insight because uh, the deeper we can go in our practice of samadhi, the deeper we still our minds and make them quiet, allow them to settle down, the more clearly we see reality as it is. Otherwise, a lot of the time, we're just projecting our wishes onto reality or hiding from what we don't want to see. Yeah. So it basically overcomes what we call the five hindrances to meditation. I want to check how many people know what the five hindrances are. Who doesn't know? OK. All right. So the five hindrances are what um, I think Ajahn Brahmali started to dub the uh, public enemy number one to meditation. And uh, all of us have them, and you're gonna keep having them until you're almost at the uh, last stage of your practice. Um, there's someone at the door. Um, maybe someone could nip out there, yeah, thanks. Uh, so the first one is basically any concern with the five senses, sometimes translated as sense desire, so, and in meditation, it's not necessarily sights and tastes, right? Because you're not seeing very much with your eyes closed. You're not tasting very much. But even the thinking about those things is a kind of desire. You can't let it go, you know. 
You close your eyes and you see the chocolate cake that you <laughs> walked past in Sheffield today and unfortunately you didn't quite have time. And maybe I'll get it tomorrow and <laughs> all the rest of it, right? And you forget that the last time you had chocolate cake, you actually felt pretty nauseous afterwards. Um, <laughs> actually, I had some very nice chocolate today, homemade and uh, hopefully not too much. So this is sense desire and uh, it distracts us from the practice. You know, especially when we're finding the practice boring and it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. Because most of us, the only real happiness that we know is happiness through the senses. It's through having our senses stimulated rather than calmed. Yeah, so we have this kind of, uh, it's the only world we know. In a way, it is our whole world. And to move inward to something like the breath at first can seem very dull. It's like there's nothing much of interest there, nothing to really hold the mind. And then the second one is like aversion or ill will. And not necessarily to a person. In meditation, this tends to manifest more as either a sense of feeling fed up with the meditation, fed up with the meditation object, and often also, <laughs> some of you are smiling, so you know what I mean. And it's good when we recognize these things, you know, because you can't expect to be free from them until you're very far advanced on this path. But also it can manifest as a kind of ill will towards ourselves and that we don't really want to allow ourselves the happiness of peace. You know, we think that we have to work harder in order to deserve it or maybe it's for others, but it's not really for us. Yeah. Or... I don't know, even feeling like, what, so what if I'm peaceful? So what if there's joy? All these other people in the world are suffering. Why should I be still? Why should I experience any bliss? And this really misses the point because, you know, it's not about deserving these things. It's not about guilt, but it's just understanding how to empower the mind and to free the mind from unwholesome states that can harm ourselves and others, right? And it's only really when we're resourced and we're at peace in ourselves that we can truly serve. So meditation is not a selfish path. It's actually moving us away from a coarser kind of joy to something much more refined, you know, to an inner joy that comes from the mind. And this joy is freely shared with others. You know, I'm sure you could feel it this morning. I felt it really strongly because I sit here and if anyone didn't, I invite you to sit at the front. But um, when Ajahn Brown meditates, there's something very powerful. And I was feeling it like a wave of metta coming over me, probably from everyone here as well, because there's something about sitting together and directing our mind towards wholesome states that's really uplifting, really inspiring, and tends to bring out the best in everyone. Even if you're feeling rubbish today, even if you're feeling sad or angry, you know, you can be influenced by the people around you and hopefully feel a little bit of support. At least, hopefully, you feel safe here, right? You feel welcome. So ill will is uh, an important one to overcome. This has gone red, Matthias. Is it okay? All right, it's okay. <laughs> it doesn't mean stop. Okay, that's good. It's not, <laughs> it's not the red light warning to stop me. All right. Um, so yeah, this ill will, it can be very subtle and it can manifest towards the breath. So it's important again to uh, develop that loving kindness early on as an antidote to that. And then the third hindrance, what is the third one? Is it the uh, restlessness, I think, or maybe the sloth and torpor? Yeah, so that's the weariness. Sloth and torpor is a bit old fashioned. It's basically weariness and a kind of grogginess of the mind. It can be physical or it can be mental. Um, and often when we come on retreat, we experience it simply because our minds have been so overused. You know, we've really been cruel to our body and minds. We've been pushing them way beyond their limits. And now we come here and we're like, come on, mind, wake up, come on. You know, what's wrong with you? You're on retreat and you're snoring, you're snoozing. My goodness, you can't do anything right. But actually, the poor mind just needs you to give it a little bit of time and allow it to just rest. And maybe, 
you know, dull out for a while. And if you can just stay with that and, you know, not interfere, not start to fight, then you'll find the energies start to come back. So the dullness and drowsiness doesn't have to be a big problem. Um, and especially if you're in a longer retreat, uh, sometimes for the first few days, people sleep a lot. I noticed one of the meditators was lying down in the meditation, which is great. You know, it's very skillful. There's not a lot of space, but, um, you know, you can lie down this evening. You can practice meditation in different postures and just allow your mind to relax. And then the fourth one is the opposite of that, which is the restlessness and uh, sometimes translated as remorse, which can come about through uh, kind of realizing that we haven't always been very skillful in our actions and our speech. And sometimes that comes up to disturb our mind. Uh, sometimes again, it can be subtle, like feeling that you're somehow, you've not quite been a good enough girl. <laughs> this is very, I mean, it happens to men as well, I'm sure, but you know, women are so much conditioned to be good girls, right? and to never really feel they're good enough. We have to serve everyone in our family, we have to give, we have to self-sacrifice, <laughs> and all the rest, you know. And this leads to a lot of remorse. We feel like, oh, I can't quite, you know, settle because there's something more I should do. Yeah, and, and there's also the worry, which is uh, very common, certainly in my family, and I think just in society in general. You know, we always worry that we're maybe not good enough or something's going to go wrong and this becomes a problem in meditation even worrying that we can't find the breath you know it's not a problem actually if we just have the patience to wait and be kind because as long as you're developing the right attitude in the present moment you know as long as you're caring as Ajahn Brahm said for whatever's right in front of you you are practicing part of the path called right intention and you're kind of laying the foundations for the breath to arise in due course. And then the last uh, hindrance, you could give like many talks on these hindrances, so this is a summary. The last hindrance is doubt. And this is an interesting one because there are different kinds of doubt and it's really the kind of cynical doubt that's difficult when you feel so much doubt about the teachings that you don't even give them a try. Right, yeah. And most of you have overcome that by being here, I think. You're here to give them a try and uh, to give them time to work. And then there's another one called, um, yeah, is that skeptical doubt as well? Sometimes we call that skeptical doubt. But there's also the kind of, uh, you could say more analytical doubt, which is more close to the wisdom faculty actually wanting to figure it out, you know, to work out, is this a good teaching? You know, what are the results? What about the monks and nuns that I meet? Are they, you know, any happier? Are they living ethical lives? You won't find us always happy. <laughs> but hopefully at least the standard of sila is pretty strong, is pretty uh, solid, right? And there's a general sense of, uh, of ease and of peace and an ability to share some loving kindness and joy with other people, an ability and a wish to serve. So these are the things we're really looking for there and that can give us confidence. And we can start to see those in ourselves as we practice on this path. But doubt can come up at any stage in the meditation, even for me as a nun of 18 years now. Uh, still, sometimes I think, hmm, is this really possible for me? You know, <laughs> Maybe I should have done something a bit differently. I never think I shouldn't have ordained, but sometimes I think, hmm, you know, all this service, isn't it kind of making me tired and losing my energy? And of course, when we doubt, we're losing even more energy. So doubt, the antidote to that is the trust. You know, just trusting that we give everything we can to the path in whatever way is possible for us according to the conditions at any one time and just trust, you know, that if we're coming from the right place, in the end, that's, that's going to lead to beautiful results. And sometimes I, I think about my life and I think about, you know, if I did die now or maybe tomorrow, <laughs> maybe a month, um, <laughs> we bargain, right? Give me a bit more time. 
But if I was to, you know, cock it very soon, um, would I be happy with the way I've lived my life? Would I think that I'd uh, wasted a lot of time or busied myself with things that don't really lead to the goal? And it's a really important question, I think, to ask from time to time, you know. And sometimes when I ask it, it gives me a lot of trust, a lot of assurance that, yeah, you know, I could generally see that I've really tried my best, given the conditions and that bit we can't control, right? But given your current conditions, what are you making of life? Yeah. So a lot of it is up to our attitude. It's up to the way we relate to what we have. And uh, this can help to, to relieve a lot of doubt, I think, and to give us confidence that we're on a good path. You know, the very fact that we're here today together is a cause for rejoicing and a cause for confidence that, yeah, something in you can, has a sense for uh, the Dhamma and a, a kind of taste of freedom, like you have a, a longing for freedom, right? And you know that what you're getting in society is not really quite enough. Not on its own. You know, maybe there's something deeper that comes from peace of mind. So they're the five hindrances in brief. And uh, I do want to get into the sutta a little bit more. So um, part of this sutta, uh, another part of it in a different place, I think it's actually the Satipatthana Sutta that says uh, one of the preliminaries to breath meditation is actually uh, restraining these five hindrances first of all. So this is part of establishing mindfulness as a prerequisite to breath meditation. So as I said, um, the four satipatthanas are not so much the foundation of that mindfulness, but they're the focus. So we already establish some mindfulness first of all by um, addressing these five hindrances and restraining them. And how do we do that? The first beautiful way of doing that is living ethical lives. Yeah. The Buddha said, um, and there's a beautiful Pali quote, Sila paribhavito samadhi, maha palo hoti, maha nisamso. And that means uh, samadhi that's empowered by virtue is of great fruit and great benefit. So that adds a little bit to the last sutta where the Buddha said it's of great fruit and great benefit only if we're living virtuous lives, yeah? So we're not just doing this to get some kind of bright flashing light and, you know, firework exhibition in our mind. <laughs> we're not just doing it so we can have like an instant enlightenment experience and write 10,000 books and make $10 billion. This is not the goal of the practice, but the goal is actually restraining our minds and living beautiful ethical lives. So in a way, for me, the foundation of Silo is a kind of attitude of giving rather than trying to get, trying to gain. You know, we start giving by changing our speech from being kind of cruel or irritable or judgmental to being kind. You know, we can use our speech as a gift to others, you know, rather than taking, stealing, using things that haven't been offered to us, we can give to others. And as monastics, we don't have a lot of uh, material things to give. We can share our chocolate if, we, if we're not too covetous. <laughs> but we give our time, you know, we give our uh, understanding of the Dhamma so much as it's developed, you know. And I used to think I'd have to wait till I was really far advanced on the path. But Ajahn Brahm said, no, if you've got something, give it. Give as much as you've got. And I find the more I give, the more I receive in return. First of all, I have to be clear about what I'm doing, right? Otherwise, <laughs> I can't sit here and say anything very useful. And also, we have to think about how it can relate to other people's lives. And uh, a lot of the time when I'm uh, sharing the Dhamma, I do really feel that it's some kind of exchange, you know? I, I kind of feel that the people listening, you, everybody here, listens kindly, listens with a wish to get something that's going to help them on the path. So the giving becomes very beautiful and a great source of joy. And so this virtue really starts to lay a beautiful foundation for the path. We 
meditate to improve our conduct of body, speech and mind and to be of benefit to ourselves and others. It's not just to have some blissful experience inside and then blame everyone else for disturbing our meditation. <laughs> you know, I remember, I think it was one of the nuns she told me that um, she was doing meta meditation one time in her parents' house or something. And uh, she was getting so into it, you know, feeling so much loving kindness flowing out to the whole world. And, you know, everything was bright and soft and beautiful. And then uh, her parents kind of came in and started making a noise and asking her to do something. And, and she was so irritated. She said, don't you know I'm doing meta meditation? <laughs> and they're like, what's that? Uh, oh, mm, well... <laughs> For those who don't know, it means loving-kindness meditation. So yes, it can be, uh, it can be difficult sometimes to, <laughs> to keep that perspective, right? If we get too self-absorbed. So sila helps with that. And uh, again, you know, the mindfulness is an important foundation before we start watching the breath. But as Ajahn Brahm said today, it has to be the right kind of mindfulness, not just kind of so-called bare awareness with a B-A-R-E, -E, but what he likes to call bare awareness with a B-E-A-R, like this bear over here, which I forget her name, his name. What's her name? Ajahn Bear. <laughs> I've got an Ajahn Bear too. <laughs> this came all the way from Perth a few years ago. Yeah, right? Hong Kong. Hong Kong, okay. But through Ajahn Brown. Yeah. yeah. So this is a real Ajahn Bear. And uh, <laughs> the point of bear awareness with a B-E-A-R is that it's soft and it's kind and it's embracing. Yeah, it actually embraces the faults that we see in our mind, in our breath, in our meditation, in our character, um, rather than pushes them away. And, you know, the kind of bear awareness with a B-A-R-E is a little bit of a myth. Because unless these five hindrances are actually fully abandoned, there's always something distorting our, our perspective. You know, it's like wearing a lens and we can't see things clearly. You know, if there's anger, it's like looking through a red glasses or something and everything looks hot. I actually had that experience in Burma once when I was upset with my teacher for teaching something I didn't think he should. <laughs> we can get very arrogant as students. <laughs> And I remember I wrote in my diary, it was as if all the green paddy fields turned red. Everything started to look you know, unfriendly and I felt like, oh, I'm not comfortable here. It's, it, it passed fairly quickly, luckily, but um, it's amazing, isn't it, when we have that particular lens. Even in our loved ones, we suddenly only see their faults. It's just not a realistic perspective at all. And uh, yeah, anyway, you can imagine other kind of lenses, but I think the meta lens is really beautiful because even though it's still a perception, you can still say it's not completely objective, it's certainly more conducive to being able to stay with the breath so that we do completely overcome those hindrances and take off that lens as well. So it's a skillful lens to pick up. And one more thing I'll say about the mindfulness before we read the first little bit, is that um, mindfulness also has an aspect of the gatekeeper, yes? So the first bit is mindfulness plus kindness, and second, mindfulness plus the gatekeeper. So the gatekeeper is like the bouncer that you put on the nightclub. And uh, there's a beautiful talk, we listened to it at the Vihara recently, and Ajahn Brown said, oh, you know, the bouncers on the door to a nightclub or, or whatever, I won't say any other places that it could be. Um, <laughs> they don't have to actually take the, the kind of riffraff by the scruff of their neck and throw them out, but just their very presence is enough to deter the uninvited guest. Yeah. So in the same way, the mindfulness is kind of caring and protective. It's just like putting these guards up on your mind. And you can even say to yourself at the beginning of the meditation, you know, if anger arises, I will let it go, or, um, you know, I will 
settle into the natural breath. You can, you can prime your awareness. You can give it an instruction in the beginning for what to be aware of or what to focus on. And this is sometimes enough. So you just condition your mind. And if you're able to keep those unwholesome states at bay, it gives you enough space, enough time to start to settle into the breath. And at that time, the wholesome states take over. So you don't have to actually, you know, throw out the unwholesome. We can sometimes just lean towards the wholesome, even a little bit of peace and quiet, even a little bit of joy in the mind. And that's enough to, to keep us with the breath. So having said all that, I'm going to continue with this beautiful sutta, which is part of the Anapanasati Sutta. And this is called the first tetrad. So these are the first four instructions. And how does mindfulness of de breathing, developed and cultivated, complete the four focuses of mindfulness? So we have it stage by stage. Number one, when the in-breath and out-breath are long and you are aware that they are long, Number two, I'm sure there's a number two here. <laughs> when the in-breath and out-breath are short and you are aware that they are short. Number three, when you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. And number four, when you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. On those occasions, you are mindful of the body having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. In and out breathing is regarded by the Buddha as a body in the category of bodies. That is why on that occasion, a meditator abides mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So here the Buddha's talking about the breath being a kind of body within the body. Yeah? So it's a little entity in and of itself. And by being with the breath, we can actually experience enough of the body for it to fulfill the first stage of the Satipatthana, the mindfulness of the body. And this first stage is um, just to get us interested in the breath, right? So just noticing whether the breath is long or whether it's short, the first two stages here are just starting to help us turn towards that breath and find something to interest the mind, yeah? Because obviously breaths can be medium or they can be like <laughs> almost non-existent, but it's just knowing the nature of that breath. And I, I love this sutta because it never says, you know, um, it should be this way or that way. It's just putting the focus on awareness it's just knowing whether it's long or short. It's not evaluating the breath. It's not uh, you know, trying to kind of control the breath. It's just simply being aware. So the mindfulness is there and the breath, you just allow it to be exactly as it is, allow it to be natural. And this is what the Buddha calls uh, the first couple of stages. It's the vitakka, which means uh, the mind directs itself to the meditation object. Yeah? So we just uh, notice what's happening right now. And later on, you'll be able to stay with the breath. So the third stage is to learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. And this stage is a little bit um, discussed or disputed in different traditions. Sometimes people talk about the whole of the breath, meaning that you experience its whole journey through the body. Um, and that's okay if that helps you to be grounded, if that helps you to stay with the breath, um, especially in the beginning when you may be feeling restless. But if you want to develop deeper samadhi to the point of jhana, to deep meditation, it's actually not so advisable to stay with the whole body because there's just too much diversity there. So we're trying to kind of... Um, Bring the mind from this kind of constant thirst for experiences and diversity and, you know, finding all kinds of things going on in the body to being with a very, very simple object and just staying 
present to that. So the way that my teacher in Burma described it also, there's this lovely Burmese phrase, asa ale aso, and it means uh, the beginning, middle and end of the breath. So we start to notice, like, how does the breath feel right at the beginning when it comes in? I don't know, close your eyes maybe and just notice. You don't have to notice the whole breath, but maybe on the in-breath, just notice like that very beginning of the breath. Where it just comes in. There's a certain feeling to that, right? It has a certain feeling. Maybe it's a little bit of tingling or it's a little bit cold or whatever it is. You can just notice that the mind can direct itself to the beginning of the breath. We're able to do that. And equally, okay, next challenge. <laughs> See if you can breathe in on that or out, whichever. I suppose you have to do both eventually. <laughs> Please do do both. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm in big trouble. Um, how does it feel? How is the end of the breath? What does it feel like? Either the end of the in-breath or the end of the out-breath. Very subtle for me, but it feels different from the beginning of the breath. Do you notice that? Can you distinguish? Yeah, subtle difference. And equally with the middle of the breath. <laughs> you can experiment in your meditation, but there's a slight difference there as well. And I was recently on retreat in America, actually, and the teacher talked about um, the eightfold breath, not the eightfold path, but the eightfold breath. And that was the beginning, the middle, the end, the gap, and then the beginning, middle, and end of the out breath and the gap. And I actually found that quite nice because my mind's quite analytical and probably quite flitty, really. It takes me some time and some you know, periods of retreat to really still the mind where I feel I don't have to think about anyone except the breath because I'm always thinking about everybody else <laughs> and myself, probably, to be honest. So uh, I found that really nice, but I mean, don't get too technical, right? This is just to interest the mind. It's not that if you don't experience all those aspects of the breath, you're not doing it right. The first two stages are just knowing whether it's long or short. And as the mind settles, you might just naturally start to be able to stay with the whole thing. And it's almost like Ajahn Brahm sometimes says, you know, it's like your hand moving, right? So the breath is coming in or out. It's like in, out. And you just stay with the whole thing. It's like the mind starts to be able to rest with the breath. I had that insight probably only after switching methods <laughs> from the, you know, the drag meditation to um, the receive meditation, let's say, where I was learning to just allow the breath to be and enjoy the breath. Um, I had this change in perception from feeling that I had to, the mind had to hold the breath, you know, like it had to grab it, to actually allowing the breath to hold the mind. And that was such a lovely change in perception, like imagining this breath almost like, you could imagine it like a wave or something to surf on, right? Or just lie on with a lilo or something. Or you can imagine it like a pillow. Sometimes I imagine it like a pillow that I can just rest my head on. My head in this case being the mind, especially the thinking mind, and just gently allow it to land on the breath. So that was really beautiful. And um, I often do that, you know, once I'm at that stage of the whole of the breath, I just have a little perception, like, you know, just allow myself to rest. And this is what we mean by resting in peace. It can be just with a single breath. And if you really are present and you really are satisfied with that breath, that gives you a lot of rest. Even if the next one doesn't come or your mind disappears, it doesn't matter. You've always got another breath, right? So don't even think about what happened a second ago. There's another breath right now. And then the next stage, the fourth one, is when you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. Yeah, 
Pasambayam Kaya Sankaram. Yeah? Pasambayam is like a pasadi. It's tranquilizing, it's calming. It's getting closer to samadhi and it's a kind of deeper letting go. And again, this doesn't really happen. None of it happens by an act of will. It happens naturally once we start to rest with the breath. It's not like you think, right, I have to calm it now. You just start to feel calm because so much diversity, so much movement is starting to settle down. So the breath starts to calm on its own. And in this case, we're aware of the body, the body of the breath, yeah? And at this point also, you notice a lot of restlessness has been overcome. Because it's the restlessness, it's like a wind that blows your mind off the breath. It keeps blowing it in different directions. Um, but here we are actually settling the mind and things are calming down. And I do have five more minutes and I would really love to get onto the uh, second part of this because this is the part that's really key. And I guess we'll be talking about it throughout the next three days um, because there's so much to say. But this is really the point where the breath starts to lose its physicality because it's calming and you start to feel a sense of joy in the mind. It can be very subtle, so don't look for anything like super duper kind of firework bliss. I mean, there can be like little shivers or there can be like a sense of rapture in the body and the mind. But sometimes the PT, what we call PT, the, the bliss, is just a sense of relief that finally the mind has settled down and it's a very peaceful experience. Maybe it's a feeling of softness or of quiet joy. I love that word quiet joy because it's not the exciting joy that sort of causes craving to arise and grasping. It's not that kind of uh, uh, frenetic or fraught joy. Oh, I might lose it, you know. It's something that happens when you just relax. Relaxing is important. And uh, this whole field of uh, piti, of pleasure arising in the mind, is the field of Vedana, the second Satipatthana feeling. So I'll read through this one. Actually, yeah. Sometimes we call feeling, like sometimes in the uh, insight traditions, they call it the affective tone of experience. I don't know if that <laughs> resonates with anyone at all. It's very technical. Um, but it basically means that aspect of experience, which is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. But in the breath meditation, in this particular sutta, it doesn't even go into unpleasant sensations or even neutral ones. It's only focusing on the happiness that can arise through the breath. So again, if you're getting a lot of suffering actually from the meditation, not the suffering in your life that will be there, but from the meditation, then you might be using a slightly wrong approach <laughs> or expecting something um, unrealistic from the meditation. So the next one also has four stages. Number one, when you learn to experience joy, PT, as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience pleasure, sukha, as you breathe in and out. Number three, when you learn to experience the mental formation of piti sukha as you breathe in and out. I'll explain that one. Number four, when you learn to calm this mental formation of piti sukha as you breathe in and out. On those occasions, you're mindful of experience Vedana, that's Ajahn Brahm's translation. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose, and mindful. For being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mi mindful of experience or feeling, Vedana. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindful of experience or feeling having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose, and mindful. Okay, so this is the sutta reference for, and the proof that you're allowed to enjoy your meditation, okay? Majjhima Nikaya number 118. <laughs> and if you don't enjoy it, it's okay, because you're just learning, we're all just learning. We don't always enjoy our meditation. 
But, um, but this is what you've got to look forward to. So as you learn to experience this joy, this piti, and then the pleasure, the sukha, and the two are kind of intertwined for a long st time on the path until you actually reach deep stages of meditation in the first, second, first and second. I think it's the second, that, is it the second or the third that it's only sukha? We have to ask Ajahn. I think it's the third that piti and sukha are together for the first two. And these are deep stages. I would also like to say here, because we are monastics and we try not to dilute things. <laughs> and I think diluting the teachings is really uh, dangerous because it deprives people of the full benefit of the path. Just experiencing piti is not the first jhana. <laughs> it's still an aspect of the second uh, stage and it will be co-joined with the sukha. So these are aspects of the jhana, the first jhana, but they're not in and of themselves first and second jhana, okay? Um, that might resonate with some. If it doesn't make sense, forget it. Later on, it may. So we experience the joy, we experience the pleasure. For me, when I experience the difference there, which is, as I say, difficult to discern, but to me, the, the pleasure is a little bit more akin to contentment. The joy is a little bit more bobbly, perhaps. The sukha is like a little bit more nourishing and satiating for the mind. It's like when you start to settle more and feel more confident, perhaps. And then this third one of experiencing the mental formation of PT sukha as you breathe in and out is very interesting. Um, I think it's just called Chitta Sankara in the Anapanasati Sutta, and that causes confusion for a lot of people. Um, but it really means the mental aspect of the joy and the happiness. So it's moving away from the body, because this is the second uh, Satipatthana, it's the feeling or experience. It's moving away from the body and starting to notice these two um, qualities in the mind. And again, it's quite subtle, but uh, quite powerful to notice the difference. I remember once meditating and the words came to my mind, conditioned by my teacher, who's lurking outside and <laughs> not allowed to come in till I finish. <laughs> um, and just these words came to my mind that he'd said in a talk, like, notice bliss. And it was strange because there wasn't much bliss at the time. It was peaceful, but it was nothing, you know, particularly notable. And uh, I just turned my mind to my mind, if you like, mindfulness to the mind, and noticed this very subtle happiness that was almost like, it was almost like tuning into a different radio frequency. You know, when you have like radio, the old fashioned ones, and you have to turn that dial and it's really hard to get the right channel and stuff. But in this case, I somehow managed to find the right channel. It was like very subtle at first and then whoosh, it just, like the radio channel started playing this beautiful song of P.T. Sukha and it was <laughs> really quite unexpected, you know, but just from turning, just from asking that question, like just notice, notice joy. And uh, as I say, it doesn't have to be something very exciting. Sometimes it can start very quiet, but sometimes it can surprise us as well. And that was definitely a joy from the mind. And as in all of these uh, tetrads, this is the second one, uh, the last stage, the fourth stage, is learning to calm this mental formation of piti sukha, yeah? As you breathe in and out. All the time it's with the breath, but it's becoming more and more mental. The breath is now just more like a feeling of joy than anything physical. And uh, the last stage in all of these is that it calms. And in my experience, it's almost as though the mind needs to drink its fill. So it needs to really uh, enjoy the piti sukha at first, especially if you're someone who has a lot of suffering in life and doesn't often have these experiences in meditation. It's like the mind just wants to drink it in. But at some stage, like with anything, right, even the most delicious homemade chocolate, you feel like you've had enough and you, you actually incline towards just calming the whole experience of taste, for example, down, yeah? So here also, we start to just naturally incline more towards calm 
and the Piti Sukha itself starts to quieten and just settle in the mind. So every stage of this meditation is like kind of experiencing something fairly, fairly clearly through the body and then the mind and then gradually calming that and naturally moving on to the next. And uh, there is a lot more to say about this, and hopefully um, we can do that tomorrow if I keep going with this. Maybe Ajahn can do the, another one where it's really deep stuff, because he needs to talk about the jhanas, like, you know, all of them and the difference between them. This is really exciting stuff. So, but I'd like to talk a bit more at some stage, and it can come in the questions as well, about this, uh, the joy in meditation and how we can encourage it. Um, but just to say now that one of the main methods I use is a lot of metta meditation. And this can go on outside the breath meditation as a separate practice, or sometimes it can be combined. Sometimes you might want to start your sitting with some metta, uh, loving kindness. Um, sometimes it's in the attitude you have to the breath. It's just gazing upon that breath with kindly eyes. You know, in the suttas it praises some monks who were living together, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Pia chaku. I think that's so beautiful. I think someone should be called that when they ordain. Pia chaku, kindly eyes. It's lovely. <laughs> who wants to ordain and be called Pia chaku? <laughs> you can't all have the same name. <laughs> one could be called Pia, one could be called Chaku. <laughs> Yeah, so we can gaze on the breath with kindly eyes. So this is the sutta, and of course that's quite a lot. So just to say, you know, again, let it land, let it settle, as we do with meditation, and don't look for these things. But uh, if the breath comes to you, see if you can just regard it with those kindly eyes and let it be. And even start to value and appreciate that breath so much that you're able to stay present to it like a friend. And then you start to see whether it's short or long, you start to rest the mind on the whole of the breath and let it calm and yeah, let it turn into some joy, let it nourish the mind. Let it be a place you can rest, yeah? So, I think that's all. And I think Ajahn's waiting to come in to teach some meditation. So we have now 45 minutes sit. So if you really, really need the loo, you're welcome. Otherwise, uh, if you can stay here and maybe just have a stretch, we can go into the meditation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.